on our panel today, we have Deanna Fergart, president and co-founder of Indigis D and senior instructor and teaching chair of the Shulik School of Energy at the University of Calgary. Sarah Hastings Simon, director of master's program in sustainable energy development at the University of Calgary and co-host of the Energy Versus Climate podcast. Ron Thiel, president Expand Interactive and Janet Lane, CWF's Director, Human Capital Center. I am thrilled to be moderating this panel and can't wait to hear from each of you, so let's get to it. In one minute, what do you think is a word or phrase to describe what industry will need of tomorrow's energy workforce? Ron, we'll start with you. Well, thanks, lots of excitement in this, so I'm grateful to be here. Uh, in one phrase, I think it's really uh, the ability for this workforce to be have an increased level level of adaptability, so that that continual learning of competencies that are needed in this growing energy sector, and the ability to unlearn those pieces as well. And the reason why is just that we're never going to have a, a lower rate of change than we have today, and it will only increase. So, uh, the ability to learn and unlearn as we evolve will be a, a key to uh, a energy workforce of the future. Great, thank you. And Deanna, what do you think? Thanks. Hi, it's good to be here. Um, I think one of the one of the key things is the skill to embrace other worldviews, other ways of thought, and other ways of seeing the challenges. Um, bringing that diverse perspective into into the group, but also being able to embrace and and welcome other other ways of looking at things. That's great. And Janet. Oh boy. Um, yeah, I, you know, listening to what we've just heard from the, from the other panels, it sounds like, goodness, it, they've got to be all things to all people, but it's, uh, it's really what it comes down to is being adaptable uh, and, and knowing, knowing something really well, but also having all of those other skills that, that helps you to um, learn, unlearn, adapt to, to new situations, get along with others, all those things. You know, maybe it's all that stuff we learned in kindergarten, but then raised to a much higher level. <laughs> That's great insight. Thank you. And Sarah, what do you think? I'll just add this concept of systems thinking. Uh, and I think that's really increasingly important as we see our energy systems, um, you know, combining in new ways, right? So with a trend of electrification, there's the idea that, you know, parts of our energy system that has never touched the electricity sector now are going to need to interact. Um, and when we look at the, the you know, sort of siloed infrastructure and, and siloed uh, organizations that have been built up behind that, that's really lacking. Um, but then also outside of the energy sector as well too, right? So the way that our energy systems start to touch our water systems also going to become increasingly important. So I think people that are able to have that deep knowledge, like Janet was saying, in one specific area, but also understand how to connect that um, with, with other parts of the system are really going to be in demand. Perfect. Um, so each of you have made very different but valuable contributions to education for the energy future. What is one thing that you or your organization is doing in this space that you want us all to know about? Uh, Deanna, we'll start with you this time. Thank you. Yeah, um, as I, I've re recently joined the uh, Schulich School of Engineering at the University of Calgary about three years ago. I spent over 20 years in oil and gas, uh, focused on environmental um, compliance, regulatory compliance operations, um, both in the upstream and in, in the midstream sector. And one of the things that I'm really excited about is the, the forward thinking and the, and the way that um, Schulich School of Engineering is not only looking at what our energy future looks like, but also how we work and how we approach things. One of my roles there is as teaching chair focused on weaving indigenous knowledge and perspectives into engineering. And so really taking those big challenges that we're facing globally and saying, not only what do we do differently, but what things do we need to do, like how we do things, how we show up, how we work together. And I, I love what Sarah said about um, systems thinking um, because historically it, we approached our work, we approached our specialties very siloed. Like you were either chemical or electrical. I mean, from an engineering perspective um, in the industry, you were either in pipelines or operations or engineering or drilling or completions. 
And we are now faced with the challenge, both from a regulatory and policy perspective, but from an imp impact perspective of looking at the entire life cycle of the work that we do. And not just the energy sector, but the energy system from production to consumption. That's really great. Um, so, uh, Sarah, what do you have to add? What is U of C doing on top of all that? Yeah, so so uh, like my colleague Dana, I also recently have actually joined the university. Um, and in my role, part of that is as director of uh, the Sustainable Energy Development Master's Program, um, which is a professional master's program that prepares students to work, uh, you know, within the energy transition, I think, uh, writ large. And I mean, part of the reason that I was really excited uh, to join the program, what I think it does that that's really important is exactly that kind of systems thinking, systems training of students, um, and really taking students from diverse backgrounds. So we we have people that come into our program that are, you know, come from engineering um, or come from a geophysics background, but we also have those that come from finance or law. Um, and it's about kind of connecting the skills that they have with where they fit with what's needed within the energy transition. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I think one thing is sort of understanding both, you know, the way that our energy systems function today, but understanding that as a starting point and not necessarily the blueprint um, for the energy systems that we're building now um, in the future. And I think that's really a, a key piece, um, you know, being able to see where those patterns emerge and where there's um, learnings that one can take from, you know, what we have today into the future without being feeling that, you know, you're sort of overly constrained because I think then that misses um, where, where things are ultimately going to go. Um, you know, I think the other, the other piece of that is really um, being able to um, have the skills to work in this period of transition, right? And so how do you manage under uncertainty? How do you think about, you know, if you're going to work for a company, um, how are their operations going to change in terms of, you know, having a portfolio of an approach to an energy transition um, that looks a lot different than, you know, it maybe did 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited about the way that our program is, is connecting across, bringing together those different specialties to give people that better understanding of how, um, you know, when we talk about energy transition, we're talking about, you know, change management, right? This is people meeting the, you know, hard tech of the systems. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting dynamics that come out uh, there. That's really great. And Ron, what would you say? Uh, absolutely. Well, actually, I'm very fortunate for the last 20 years that uh, we've been able to help um, organizations around North America and from industry, uh, academia and government really educate and um, really evolve those uh, energy workforces. And like Sarah said, it, it is about the people. It is about that you know, human centric design and how we actually deliver uh, knowledge to that uh, evolving workforce, which is quickly changing. So we use technology as a conduit. Uh, but really it's about you know one human at a time and giving them what they need to be successful in their in, in their particular uh, instance in life and so what whatever that diversity or inclusivity is in their background we want to make sure that they have the ability to succeed in their in their career so technology is our conduit and we've been quite successful across you know traditional e-learning all the way to mixed reality augmented virtual reality as well as bringing in machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to really support a human-centric uh, transfer of knowledge to support one person at a time. You guys all have some really cool stuff going on. <laughs> it's fantastic. It makes me want to uh, go to energy school. Um, <laughs> so we've heard from employers and employees, but what do you think the system, as Sarah said in the first question, uh, needs to do to address future workforce needs? And we'll start with Sarah, actually. So I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna come back to a similar theme again, but you know, it, I mentioned, I think that these jobs are going to require um, really understanding outside of the typical silos. Um, and so I do think that the university system, you know, needs to get better at understanding how to, you know, educate and prepare people um, for say technical jobs with maybe a deeper understanding of, of some of those soft skills that, you know, they haven't been getting previously. Um, you know, I think also, 
one of the challenges that I see it, with that pace of change is that applies also to both the, the curriculum that we're teaching at a university, um, you know, the, the pace at which that changes. Um, it's very different to teach a class on, you know, the state of solar power versus uh, a physics class on thermodynamics, right? One of those hasn't changed in, in hundreds of years and the other one is, is rapidly um, updating. Um, and then I think also finding ways to educate people um, when they leave, you know, the, the kind of formal education that they have um, within a, a university um, construct, for example, you know, over the, the lifetime of careers of um, those that are entering the field today, but that are also working in the field today, there are lots of things that are going to be changing. And so I think we also have a responsibility as a system to try to, you know, do a better job of really finding ways to enable that, um, you know, as was brought up before, but that, you know, lifelong, uh, lifelong learning piece. Thank you. Uh, and Ron, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's a lot of evolution that has to happen. First of all, knowledge and education in general, I think needs to be understood as more of a capital investment rather than an operational cost. And really building a culture of learning is, is really important. So not just a hierarchy of, of competencies and compliance, but really one of a matrix that's built on performance, engagement, and really behavior of a workforce so that we can evolve. And really taking that, uh, that human-centric approach to that. But I think from the most part, it starts from industry itself, because I think right now there's a lot of redundancy that we can, we can alleviate uh, by creating some industry best practices across the board. And that's for you policymakers to, to execute. But for the most part, it's, uh, it's something that we can work on together because there's, there's a lot of ambition, a lot of care, and a lot of very smart people that can actually take this industry to the next level here. And I think with that knowledge being shared accordingly, it can be done uh, much more effectively. Thanks, Ron. And Deanna, what do you think the system can do? Yeah, um, I first of all, just would love to say I, I'm so honored to be with, with these folks. Ron, we, you said about um, the, that culture of learning and and human capital is, is a shift that I really believe we need to see throughout the system. That it's, uh, somebody said in an earlier panel, um, that they were a permanent student. I think the words were something like that, lifelong student. And that's how I feel. Like I, I, two of the major courses that I teach in engineering are introduction to environmental engineering and sustainable development and energy, which is continuously, like I feel like every, every semester I'm iterating it to keep up with what's happening globally. And the challenge I feel is on me who is no longer like embedded in the, um, in the industry to stay up to up to date. And it's one of the reasons I'm grateful for being part of things like the Energy Futures Lab. Um, but also looking at knowledge as capital and, and really, really investing in our employees, in our students and building that capital because that's what's gonna, it's yes, technology is important and techn technology will never go away, but it's how we apply it, how we evolve it and how we adapt it to meet the future needs that, that um, that's going to really make a difference. And um, I'm excited to see not just the University of Calgary, but other universities across uh, Turtle Island. I'm here in Treaty 7 territory. I'm personally from Treaty 8 territory. Um, a lot of universities and engineering faculties and other faculties looking at how do we change the system? How do we decolonize our education system? How do we bring in indigenous worldviews and perspectives and other worldviews and perspectives to look at things from a holistic way. Um, and it's really, it's it's a total shift in paradigm that we're still in the early days of. I'm just, I'm excited to be a part of it. Thanks, Deanna. That's great. Now, Janet, over to you. What do you think the system uh, needs and what do, what can policymakers do? Wow, well, you know, I've, I had an inkling of this before, you know, as we got ready for this and, and then listening to this to the panels today, I'm thinking, well, you know, we have to actually revamp the whole system. Uh, and I'm sorry, but, you know, those of you who are teaching in university are, um, are you know, you're, you're, you're the ones that, that get it on the, you know, in, in out there, but I don't think that 
everybody in the university system gets it. But I mentioned kindergarten before, and I think it actually, we have to start differently in our K to 12 system as well. And, you know, I'm, I, my background was in literacy and numeracy and believe me, I, there's nothing more important than getting that, you know, those basic education pieces um, taught and understood because from there, all other learning can happen. But it seems to me that we, we instead of being vertical, vertical in our, in our education system, right? You know, the children go through um, in batches <laughs> all the way through the, the education system, and then they go to their post-secondary program and they're in their silos and they go through their, through, through their silos. Everything we've heard today and everything we know about actually the world in general is that we need to become much more this way. Um, you know, I, I, I'm more of a generalist that has a specialty than a specialist. Um, and, and I really do get the need for that from everything that we've heard. So we're going to need to think in terms of teaching the basics and then teaching all those things that we've heard a lot about today, creativity, communication, collaboration, uh, systems thinking, um, problem solving, all of that. We need a, you know our, our whole workforce but also all of our citizens, which are basically the same thing, but you know, we, we, we think of, of school, the school system as being creating citizens and engaged learners rather than workers. But all of that is going to have, have to be taught in, um, start to be better taught, I think, in, um, in the K to 12 system. It won't ever be finished. It, you know, that's the other thing we've heard today is that this will continue all along. But I think we have to take the, the um, you know, help our, our children understand how to collaborate, um, how to work together, how to take feedback from each other, how to debate with each other um, without thinking that you, you're, you know, both side is wrong. If we've seen the world anywhere today, we need to know that we, we can't be on, on, uh, on the opposite sides. And then, so we've got all of that middle um, sort of session uh, stuff to learn about being human together. And then we'll need to get into the functional skills that are used in, um, in our work. So, you know, you go into finance or you go into data or you go into geology or you go into nursing. And then on top of that, um, we're going to, to need uh, some really, well, maybe, maybe nursing doesn't fit there, but the, you know, you, the functional pieces that, that are transferable across all kinds of organizations and all kinds of um, industry sectors, and then, and then get into the very specific stuff that you need at, if you're in accounting in an engineering firm, or if you are in human resources in, a, in you know, any other kind of an energy firm or whatever. So, so I think that rather than being siloed this way, we have to be more stratified um, um, horizontally in our thinking. Now, how we go about doing that and how I would write the paper up that says to policy, you know, to policymakers in, in, uh, in uh, provincial governments, that, that, that's another story. And, you know, Stephanie, you and I can start working on that tomorrow. But I do see you know, everything we've heard today would tell us that, um, that nobody is going to be in a silo everybody is working across the board. Things are changing so quickly. We have to be adaptable. We have to be able to learn, unlearn, relearn, um, and work together all the whole time as we're doing this. The other thing that I would say is this is not just about um, the formal education system. That's the other thing we, we've heard today. Employers need to be a major part of that. And experiential learning needs to start happening a whole lot sooner so that the, you know, our school children are learning how to apply what they're learning um, in, in ways outside of the classroom, let's say. I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Janet. So we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so our panel has uh, gone a bit quicker than I thought it would. So let's open the floor to everybody. Um, what, if you were a student today, looking to get into energy, what would you tell them? What path would you go down or where would you look? Or, you know, let's just 
broaden the conversation a little bit. Ron, let's start with you. I'll put you on the spot. It'd be scary trying to talk to my younger self. That's a ways back. <laughs> um, uh, but adaptability and right and building that learning culture. I mean, right now, I know when I went to school, I actually for geophysics way back in the day, it was you know getting to that final exam and getting onto the next set of skills. Uh, but these days, it's around carrying those skills with you. And again, I'll go back to the ability to continually learn and unlearn and being a lifelong student. Um, the two things I would say to a, a young person is uh, curiosity and empathy are really two big pieces of the puzzle that are always going to evolve uh, a learner to where they need to go. And those are really two big pieces that will also fight the polarization we're seeing these days in opinions. Thanks. Anyone else want to jump in? Sure, I, I can. I mean, I think to me, one piece of advice I often give when I'm asked a question like this is really for people to find, you know, what they're interested in and what they're good at, right? And I think it's, it's about holding that, you know, Find, finding the, the kind of bigger goal that you want to work towards, I think is important. And, and obviously, you know, having chosen to do so in energy, I think it's a great space to be in. Um, but when it comes to the day to day and the work that you're doing, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to work in energy. And I would go far, so far as to say, you can have almost any job within the energy space, right? You can be in finance, you can be in the legal parts, you can be in engineering, you can be in sales, you know, they, they're sort of a way to do almost every single thing within the energy sector. So um, it's about, to me, figuring out what is it that you know you want to do? What is it that you're good at? Where do your skills overlap with those different kinds of spaces? Um, and then look to, to carve that niche out because it's really, yeah, there's, you know, I think it's, it's to me, every, every job can be an energy job and, and you've just got to figure out what's the, what's the way that you want to make into it. And Deanna, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think I would say be um, be curious. Don't be afraid to not have a roadmap or not know the answer, because we are in a time right now where we know where we want to get. We've got lots of really, really grand goals, but that, those roadmaps, I mean, it's not like it was where this is your job. These are your roles and responsibilities. And, and I say this to my students every day because part of the courses I teach is bringing Indigenous perspectives. And a, a lot of... Um, shall I say, engineering, people that are drawn to engineering, including myself, struggle with not having, like there is no right answer. Like it's about challenging the way you're looking at things. It's about going deep inside and, 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 and examining your responses, examining your biases, examining your perspectives from what you're hearing and really transcending that polarization of, um, what is good energy, what is bad energy, and all these, these challenging conversations that we're having. I'm having my students engage in those conversations. And part of that is learning how to create spaces where it's safe to do that. Um, I love the terminology that I think uh, it's come out of the LGBTQ community, but we've embraced it with the Energy Futures Lab, the concept of brave spaces. And I, um, somebody mentioned it earlier about um, no, like getting comfortable. I think, Janet, it was you um, teaching folks to learn how to debate without attacking the person or without feeling like we're attacked. Like it's okay to debate. It's okay to see things differently. And um, how do we do that in a way that that keeps the goal in mind and empowers people to bring their passion, even if it's divergent views. Like, I think there's so much magic that can happen when you just create those spaces, but it's not an easy thing. And I always kind of smile when people say soft skills because man, those are the hardest skills that I've had to learn. <laughs> like, um, and I think that's, that's really, you know, that, that piece of teaching how to show up in a way that that welcomes everybody's perspective is is key and it's not part of any curriculum um you know until recently that i've, I've seen before like formal uh formal curriculum per se sorry i see you nodding is there anything you want to add Oh, um, yeah, just to really <laughs> echo Deanna's point about the, the so-called soft skills. So certainly, you know, people that are coming from the more uh, technological side, as, as I also did, you know, I think it's great if there's ways to, um, you know, practice those and learn those uh, earlier on. I think I learned them in my first job after I uh, got my PhD, and, and that was maybe a little late, although it was early enough, I guess. Um, but, but I think there are more opportunities to do that now, and so really to try to take advantage of those. 
Yeah. What about you, Ron? Well, I like the fact that we do need to work together. I think, especially here in Canada, we have the opportunity to really, you know, really evolve this workforce and be a global leader. And doing so together is, I think, the only way to go. So, the, you know, we we have a increasing demand for energy globally. Uh, we know we're going to be carbon based for some time, and that will uh, likely increase in the short term. But look at all the great minds moving us towards a, a more diverse and sustainable future as well. So it's uh, it's important to understand that that you know cross pollination of all those opportunities within there and. And like you said, Sarah, there's room for everybody within that space to do whatever we like, which is fantastic. You know, I think that we do have a, a bit of a problem in that, you know, if, if I was a student listening to this today, I would be thinking, yes, but, but, but which program should I go into? Like, you know, where am I going to find a job at the end of the next four years? And so, you know, to give them something to, to go with, to go away with it, you know, that we can't just say, just, just find your passion. It'll be okay. There'll be a job there for you. Although the truth is that there will be, um, you know, there, there's not enough young people going, you know, that it, um, going to be available for the workforce a few years down the road. There's, they're going to be in very high demand, um, which is not to say they can slack off. But, um, but what we also need, apart from, um, you know, from this wonderful, this thinking that we've that we've had here today, that you know, the lots is possible if you are flexible and adaptable, and you know, and so on. But we need the the labor market information that's going to have to come from the sector as to what exactly they are looking for in terms of, you know, in four years time or two years time, I'm going to need X number of people who can do this. And if you can do that, I'm going to at least interview for you for the job. And we need, so we need better labor market information. We need very specific information about, yes, we understand all these lovely things that Janet's explained, you know, across the board around um, those um, transferable skills, but we're also going to need some very specific information around we need people who can do this and, and as, as long as they can do everything else and, and this. And so what is that? what are those individual pieces that will get you into the hydrogen economy or into the um, electric vehicle economy or into um, you know, the, the, the batteries of the, you know, of the, of the future or, or whatever it is that is an energy job of the future. So we need our employers now to start thinking about what they're going to need, not just today, but tomorrow and how many. And I know things are shifting and it's really hard to pinpoint, but I think our governments need to be working with employers much more closely to determine that. And then that information has to get to the people who are who are providing the education and training, the Rons, the, the Deannas and the Sarahs of the world who can say, Okay, so now I've got my marching orders. I know that I have to prepare this many people because I think we're going to find that um, our energy uh, companies are not going to have the people they need if we're not you know, ready for that. And we're gonna have students who are thinking, um, sorry, I'm, you know, I've, I've gotta go somewhere where I, can, where I can see a job that, that is going to be there for me. So we have to provide that information in much more detail. Well, thank you, everyone. That was great. And uh, I hope the audience also got a lot of value out of that. I know I will be thinking about how can we break down silos? Um, and how can we prepare for the future? And where can we add value through policy work? So thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will toss it back over to Justin.